Hello everyone, welcome back to Toronto Machine Learning Annual Conference 2021. My name is Nadia, I'm a senior machine learning engineer and today I'm really happy to have the opportunity to introduce our other two amazing speakers for today. This is our last session but for sure not least one and uh, the topic here is really interesting. Okay, before starting, I would like to remind you that if you have a question, please post it in the chat so I will collect all the questions and ask them directly to our speakers. Our speakers for this session are Ludovic Begay and Mohamed Sabri. Ludovic is a senior global CRM and customer experience strategist with 20 years of success in deploying data science, customer centric, and omni channel marketing with various local and international organizations. As a CRM and data science director at L'Oreal Canada since 2020, Ludovic leads a team that is solely focused on building better and profitable consumer experience by bringing data capacity with digital and marketing platform. Mohamed Sabri is a result-driven data science and MLOps specialist with eight years of experience in machine learning and deep learning, system design concept, understanding data architecture concept, data modeling, project design, and project implementation. He has a very wide range of project experience for various industries and has been also a director of data science and AI in a startup in Montreal. Mohamed is capable of supporting all organizations in their AI project implementation and he also is also the author of the book Data Science uh, Pocket Wide, available on Amazon. Please join me in welcoming Ludovic Begay and Mohamed Sabri. Hello everyone. Hello everyone. I'm uh, Ludovic Beguet uh, from uh, L'Oréal Canada, talking from uh, Montreal. As Mohamed is also uh, in Montreal, so we are very happy to uh, be presenting to you this afternoon. So our topic uh, is a uh, L'Oréal Canada data, data science roadmap. Uh, so uh, the, the 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 agenda for this presentation there will be uh, three uh, three things that we will uh, see together. So if you want, want to move to the next slide, uh, Mohamed. Absolutely. So the first portion is uh, I will give you some context uh, of uh, the work that was started a couple of months ago with Mohamed. So context about L'Oréal Canada, what our data context. Then uh, Mohamed uh, will explain to you his approach. So how he's guiding us in this uh, data science roadmap and uh, advanced analytics roadmap here at L'Oréal Canada. And I will come back to uh, to present you some output, some next steps, and also some uh, recommendation and uh, criteria for, for success if ever you embark on this uh, data science uh, journey. So in terms of context, uh, if you can move to uh, the next slide, thank you very much. In terms of context, so L'Oreal Canada, uh, I'm pretty sure you, uh, you know the, the, the brand. Uh, again, we can go to the next, thank you very much. So L'Oreal Canada was founded uh, in Canada in 1958, so a little bit more than 60 years ago. Uh, of course, it's from France, uh, L'Oreal. Uh, we are almost uh, 1,500 employees uh, here in Canada. Uh, half, uh, half of it are working either on the field or supply chain, distribution center, etc. The other uh, are more in the offices. Uh, the big thing to know for you about L'Oreal Canada is that uh, we are not just L'Oreal Paris brand. So we have uh, actually 37 diverse and complementary brands that we sell. And uh, very interestingly, uh, and you will see that in terms of data and uh, data, the, the data capacity, we have a variety of distribution channels. So we sell directly to consumer through our website, to some of our stores for kills, for example. But we also sell uh, indirectly through a pharmacy, grocery store, Amazon, etc. And we also have B two B B two B brands like Redcan, for example, for salon or hairdresser. So it it gives us a variety of context and of uh, data, uh, data not lakes, but uh, data, data bases. If you go to the next slide, uh, the, the way I see uh, myself and my team here at L'Oreal Canada, it's really, uh, our mission is to build bridges, bridges, bridges that uh, link external world to internal world. So a consumer with brand, consumer with products, but also bridges internal, uh, internally in the company. So between technology and teams, and between data and activation. And so you would it's, it's a key uh, point in uh, everything that Mohamed will be speaking about is uh, fixing, solving business issues. So using the data 
to activate on data and build growth for the company. So of course, my goal is to de deliver the, the right and the optimal brand experience to consumer, but uh, you will see also that this applies to everything else, supply chain, uh, personalization, digital experience, etc. So when we look at uh, the various aspects of data, as I said, we have many brands. We have also the different channels of distribution. So we have data almost everywhere uh, at L'Oreal Canada, from plans, supply chain, product information, everything related to sales. We have uh, digital analytics, consumer, etc., uh, etc. Et so we have a massive amount of collected data all over Canada. Some of them structured, other unstructured. And if we uh, if we if we uh, go uh, to the next one. What we do today uh, at L'Oreal Canada with this data is mostly, I would say, understanding the past and mo monitoring the present. So it's 90, 90, 95% of our efforts are there. So we, we believe data is gold and could transform and build growth uh, uh, for the company. But we mostly put all our efforts in terms of human resource and uh, also uh, in terms of tech towards uh, that. So there's almost no effort. Uh, done on prediction, prescription, so looking at the future, helping us uh, build the future. From a tech standpoint, on the right, you can see that I, I just put a few examples of uh, what we have, but we are not power, poor in terms of uh, technology, and we are not uh, we are able to invest in terms of technology. So uh, when you look, look at what we do, it's not a technology issue, it's more about uh, we don't know how to get to the next level. And that's exactly why we hired uh, Mohamed uh, as a consultant uh, to our team. So he started, uh, if you can uh, go to the next, uh, Mohamed, we, um, he started his mission. So we call that a data compass to build our compass with the, uh, a, a couple of objectives. First, of course, assessing our current data practice. He will show you that. And then assessing where we should be and where we could be uh, in terms of data. And the goal is really to deliver business impact with limited resources, not from a technology standpoint, but more from a human standpoint, and while creating trust, trust in data, trust in the value of this exercise. So Mohamed, up to you uh, to explain to, uh, to us how, how you did that. Uh, thank you, Ludovic, for uh, this, uh, this great introduction. Uh, so uh, like Nadia said, my name is Mohamed. I, I run a company called Rocket Science Development. Uh, so basically, I'm a big fan of space. Uh, I love aerospace in general. So I said, why not like starting a company and name it Rocket Science? And a, a lot, lot of people, they find it pretty cool. Um, so basically, like Nadia said, I, I published a book called Data Scientist Pocket Guide. Uh, so this is basically a book for people that want to get introduced to data science world. It's not a hands-on book, so it will be more a book that explains concept uh, like what is a random forest? How does it work? What's the mechanic under the hood? So this is the type of thing I, I did on, on, uh, on this book. Uh, some of the achievements we have for uh, this year, uh, a couple of customers I work personally with or I have people in my team working with them, either from a strategic standpoint when it comes to AI, like with L'Oreal Canada, but as well from more ML ops side or operation side of the machine learning. Uh, if if you, you follow a bit of uh, the, the Toronto machine learning conferences, I gave conferences during the last, uh, this quarter and the last quarter around ML ops and how to put in production machine learning models. Uh, so our framework, basically, the way we process this, and this is based on our experience with L'Oreal, but as well on our previous experience with customers I personally worked with or my team is working with. So, and every time we meet a new customer, we update our framework, we make sure that it's, it, it, it's streamlined, that it followed like a state of the art when it comes to the implementation of an AI practice in general. So usually it starts very simple. We start with an assessment. So you assess your level of maturity when it comes to data valuation. And I'll show you in detail the full framework because it's available like as an open knowledge uh, online. Uh, you can download it later if you want and use it in your, in your organization or just as per your own knowledge. After assessing the level of maturity, you identify project with high value to the organization. And this relies on a specific framework because a lot of people, they come to me and like, hey, Mohammed, how do you personally say if a project has value or not to an organization? And that's pretty much a very important point as well. 
then you have the ability to define the feasibility of the machine learning project of a machine learning project it's cool to have a high value project but is it technically feasible how you as a manager would you with your skills your knowledge of the field that can be limited sometimes can potentially uh, define the feasibility of a project and your ability to prioritize project. We spend a lot of time with Ludwig on this portion because we identified, if I don't remember, more than 40 projects or so. So we had basically to play that game where we sit down together and we prioritize them. Then, of course, a classic one, the ability to scope a machine learning project. Mike can tell some tricks. I usually always consider the scope uh, which actually will uh, feed uh, like uh, the, the, your statement of work and could be used and is basically your your compass when you work on a project because sometimes you or people in your team you're delivering you're developing and you might just forget what's the actual mission or what's the actual objectives behind this project especially in complex project it requires a solid scope of work then uh, necessary profiles to build your team uh, data science is an evolving field so you need that ability to always understand what are the profiles that are available today on the market and which type of profiles you need because there is not just data scientists to be able to to have success in ai you need many many profiles and we'll look at them in details after then you have the ability the last phase step is just basically a step i added that contains some of my personal advices that I usually give to people when they want to implement an AI practice. So why is this necessary? Why not just, you know, jumping in and do something quick and, you know, uh, I mean, and L'Oreal Canada, they experienced that and a lot of companies, they experienced that. They hire people and they start POCs based on what they think is politically stra like strategic for the organization to start with as a project. But the thing is, if your practice like has a lack of strategy, vision, and operationalization, 100% it will potentially uh, fail because you don't know where you're going exactly. You don't have what we called with Ludovic a compass. Uh, yeah, that's more like details about the concrete deliverable, but now I could move to the... What I said is, op is an open knowledge. So basically, it's completely freely available on the website. You can have a look at it, uh, download it as well. Um, I'll send the link on the chat so you can have a look at it either now or later. Go under Knowledge Center, build in your AI practice in seven steps. And here, basically, you will have the framework that you can download. It's a, it's a light framework, 30, 30 pages, 30 pages. So it shouldn't be like that much hard to digest. As I said, we start with our scorecard. This is a scorecard that is pretty interesting because it contains something like, I think 20, 15 questions. And over the 15 question, it helps you assess basically some of data aspect. That's something I usually do. People, they ask me, you do AI, why you ask question about data? I ask question about data because data is the source. So I need to know what are the tools that you have related to data, like for example, data lineage, any cleansing or transformation, like tools, proper transformation tools that you have. Uh, if you have a business intelligence practice or not, do you have a data warehouse? So this is typically the type of question we ask from a data perspective. Then you have everything related to the data science aspect of it. Sometimes you meet customers, they've never done any POC in machine learning, others they've done some. Uh, so it's usually good indicators. Why this type of questions? Because they are good indicators. They help assess the level of maturity. Because with that, you have a better understanding of which type of organization I was talking to. Because there are people that are super advanced when it comes to data. So their jump to data science machine learning becomes much more easier. But others, they struggle more maybe because they're not maybe that much exposed to the value of the data. They don't have the proper tools when it comes to data management. Uh, they don't see much of a value inside the organization in terms of data uh, and data science. And then you have every question related to the business and the culture. This is very important because the culture plays a critical role uh, in an organization that, that is aspiring to become like uh, 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 like data driven. So with this, you'll have like a, an overall computed score and your score will allow you later to basically 
go for some of the insights we drafted based on the point that you formulated. No judgment. I never say no, not, and, and I've never said no to a company that is just like not enough mature. It's just the plan is different because it takes a different roadmap and maybe we'll not start with data science right away. We will start having focus on other aspect of the data potentially, because it's more a priority and it will become a basement for the data science project and machine learning project that we can perform later. So after that, you'll have the ability to have a look at the identification of project would have a high value to your organization. There is a framework that I created with my old company, Nikando Solution, and this framework is pretty interesting. It's called TLD. It stands for time, logic, and data. Time, logic, and data is basically the three dimensions that will help you uh, chase the project with high value. What does it mean, logic, data, and time? Logic means that the problem, underlying problem that you have identified, and you're asking yourself, is machine learning appropriate here? You have to identify if this specific problem has a recurring logic in it. What does it mean concretely? I can give you an example. For example, let's say you targeted, uh, your, you work for a law firm, okay? You said to yourself, hey, it could be cool if we can use machine learning to support the legal assistant job. Now, as a work, you have to ask yourself the problem for legal assistant. Uh, does it contain any uh, like logic behind it, any recurring logic in its own work? So you rely on the business or on the, on the business process at the end and you try to find logic because machine learning needs logic in the underlying problem. If the problem is completely random or chaotic, it's harder to predict. So it's harder for machine learning to extract patterns. For time, the resolution time is very important as well. The ability, for example, to see if the problem, if a specific problem that we're trying to automate with machine learning is already solvable very fast with any other type of technology, or it's already the case uh, done by human, then the purpose of machine learning becomes a bit useless. And then obviously you have the data. If the data is, if there is any data available, it doesn't have to be digital data. It can be physical data anyway. It can be, uh, uh, it can be like uh, d digitalized later. So that's not much of a problem. So and yeah, you you you'll definitely read it in depth. It comes with examples, uh, comes with more details about the framework, and of course you have as well the, the feasibility of a machine learning project. So basically, here it helps you. It guides you on how to look for specific information either on the web or from the data that you have to be able to uh, analyze the feasibility of a machine learning project. Uh, here it comes with a specific scenario. I love giving, I'm, I'm, I'm an example guy, so I love giving examples always everywhere. Uh, so all the document comes with concrete examples. Then the prioritization aspect, this is pretty cool here, a small mistake from the, the graphic designer should go this way, but that's very fine will be corrected next week. Uh, value feasibility quadrant. Uh, that's something I, I, I love working with because this is how we organize our workshops. It's inspired by the way design thinking works because uh, I'm certified for design thinking. And uh, basically this is inspired, this portion is inspired of the way uh, they, they, they do the framework in design thinking. Uh, then this is the scope of work, scope of work. And this is basically something you can reuse as a cheat sheet to build up your own scope of work when it comes to data science. Um, and then the necessary profiles. Like I said, there is not just data scientists. This is some of the, 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 the roles that you can find in the sphere of data science, from the machinery engineer to the MLOps engineer, ML software engineer, data engineer, research data scientist, data scientist, business analyst, data analyst, and with the role skills and different tools that they might or might, yeah, that they might master. Pretty much interesting if you look into build up job descriptions and looking for specific profiles to solve your problem and build your teams. And obviously it comes with a different task that they perform in the life cycle of data science. So have an in-depth look at it as well, because here you'll see the task and what are the associated roles that comes with this specific task and the typical day-to-day. -day. 
So yeah, and then I end up this with some of my good comments when it comes to implementing a data science practice from your roadmap, defining your objectives and vision, uh, the MLOps environment, very important to, to think MLOps from the beginning of your practice, because it's definitely a portion that a lot of people, they have a hard time with. The importance of communication, the importance of change management, because yes, it's, it's data focused, but at the end of the world, you implement data focus strategies in a world of human. So it needs you to help them change their habits, their way of working and so on. Yeah, so that's basically the, 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 the framework. Uh, anyway, if you have any questions about it, don't hesitate to reach out. I invite you as well, have a look at the Knowledge Center because there are other pretty cool things here, like for example, uh, we compiled one of the largest database uh, of use cases. So you have more than 40 industries here. We could look at, for example, MRO Aerospace, and you would find some, some use cases that you could have a reading about the use case in case you're looking for inspiration to start uh, like projects in your organization. Same thing for MLOps. We did like a large MLOps review of tools that exist in the industry based on the product category. So I'll go back to my slides uh, and I'll let Ludovic uh, maybe uh, talk to us about the outputs and the next steps of the framework. Yeah, thank you, Mohamed. Uh, thank you very much. So some up outputs of that. So uh, just to, to let you know, in terms of time frame, we started uh, this project, I would say, in May. And uh, Mohamed started interviewing the, uh, the business stakeholders. I will come back to that after uh, in June. So it's, uh, I would say it was a, a 10 weeks uh, effort, uh, roughly, uh, Mohamed, correctly if I'm wrong, but it was a ba basically it, also depending on our own av availability here at L'Oreal. So it's, uh, it's, it's sometimes taking time to just get the, uh, the right people to talk to. So the assessment of L'Oreal Canada, this is a type of thing that we uh, we got from uh, from Mohamed. Of course, I just uh, pick a few elements of it. We had a, a full uh, report and a, he came to present to our, our steering committee, our executive committee. But it's basically saying that L'Oreal Canada is not a baby, but it's not an adult yet uh, uh, in terms of, uh, of data. And uh, no surprise there, to, uh, to be honest. So we are in between uh, childhood and uh, being a teenager. Uh, and the, the, the interesting things that was mentioned by Mohamed is that we have various areas where we need to be better. Of course, the first one was data governance and, and is still data governance. So we need to govern, we need to manage our data, we need to identify data owner, data steward, put, put a real data management and data governance practice here at Canada to be sure that we increase the quality of, uh, of, of our data and also the, the readiness of our data. There were other things uh, that, that were um, mentioned and there is this overall data maturity assessment. Things about uh, technical, technical aspects, things about organizational uh, aspects, so the use of my uh, data team and uh, what they focus on and maybe why, where they should put their focus, where they should shift uh, their, their focus. So that's the first portion of it. He came also uh, with a technical and organizational recommendation. So from a tech standpoint, I won't go into detail, but it's really uh, exactly what Mohamed mentioned when he said ML ops environment. So to have a technical environment that is uh, allowing you to test, uh, to, uh, to version, version your efforts and to actually industrialize your, your effort. And uh, I think one of the big mistakes that we uh, we could have done and uh, that most of companies uh, do when they start that, is they do proof of concept and it just stay there. And uh, it will never be put in, in production and uh, work for real in real life and for more than uh, two weeks or two months. So um, uh, Mohamed explained to us how to build that and work with the IT team. He also gave us some organizational recommendation and uh, help us structure, I will show you in, uh, in the slides after, how to structure our, 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 um, our workforce and uh, to, uh, to be sure that we use our team members, our, our lean data talent, the right way to deliver value. The last portion of it is use cases and priorities. So I think it's, uh, I would say it's the most uh, important thing uh, that we did because it's the way to uh, to hook and or to take the attention, to grab the attention uh, from the executive because you would start by uh, talking to them with their own business uh, issues. So we started by their business issues. We mapped these business issues. We saw where we could help with data science project or with data project. 
And as explained by Mohamed, we put that on, on some kind of grid on the, the right, where we can uh, see the impact, revenue, cost, but also the feasibility. And feasibility, also to, uh, to piggyback on what, on what Mohamed said, it could be a feasibility from a statistical standpoint, but that's honestly, that's not the biggest hurdle uh, that we could have. The feasibility is more from an operation standpoint. So I will give you an example uh, from a stat standpoint. It, it seems quite easy, might not be that easy, but uh, it's, it's, it's not impossible to look at everyone, every customer that we have in our database and find a way to say, okay, for each one of these single customer, consumer, we know exactly the type of picture that we need to send, the type of promotion, the type of channel, et cetera, et cetera. So we can have something very personalized, completely relevant to the consumer. Statistically, statistically speaking, not impossible to do that. And honestly, really feasible. But from a process standpoint, uh, we need to have all the assets ready, picture, uh, text, promotion, uh, translation, etc. cetera. The, the, the company, my company is not ready yet to get there. So it's typically a project where we, we would put a high impact, but a very low feasibility or at least a low feasibility. So we, it's not something that we want to tackle, tackle first. So if you go to, to the next slide, um, Mohamed, there's two uh, big things that we are we are working on. So of course we got uh, we built together and we presented our, with our executive the, the roadmap. So with use cases, with hiring plan, with uh, this type of things, and we are already working on two use cases. Uh, so one is related to Amazon. So it's a pre predictive modeling that uh, half, half of it is already done. So we start in September and uh, Mohamed and his team has already done a proof of concept that was presented to, uh, to the business team. So it's uh, su super promising. There's an, an, as well, another use case that is more uh, uh, related to uh, customer retention uh, that uh, would be kicked off, uh, that was kicked off and that we would start working on very, uh, very shortly. The other thing on the right that we are working on, and I mentioned about the organization of our workforce. So uh, Mohamed came with this idea of uh, building a lab for, for, for a data lab for, for, for L'Oreal Canada. And there's two benefits uh, for it. Of course, there's financial benefits to have an innovation lab because you can get credit from uh, both federal and provincial government. But it's also um, a way to have the, the lean data talent focus on solving the core data, uh, the business issues that we have at L'Oreal and stop using them to, de to do day-to-day -day, uh, day -day activities and extinguishing fires. So that's something that we are also building right now uh, in Canada. Uh, if you can move to the next one, Mohamed. Yes. And, uh, oops, that was the title. So my, my conclusion uh, on that, uh, of, uh, of this effort, so the, uh, this, I would say, three months effort, and now we are at five months because we are starting working on the use cases. Uh, it's a success. It's a, it's really a success. Uh, so L'Oreal Canada had initially some appetite uh, to uh, and some uh, some will to get uh, to the next level in terms of data. So we we did not create it. We have not created the the, the will and the uh, uh, the hunger or the appetite for that. But we really really created traction, and so we now have a very strong executive sponsorship from our CFO, from our CEO, from our CTO. And why that? It's basically because we first started by business. And uh, the first time I met with Mohamed, uh, when, uh, when we were looking for people to help us, what I liked about him is that he, he was talking about business. So he was able to have a business conversation with me. So of course, he's a super geek and a super, uh, su uh, super good from a tech standpoint. That's, that's the, the fundamental. But that's not, that's not how we get traction and you, you will get uh, engagement from your, from your executive. So you need people who speak business uh, and uh, who are able to understand business. And when they will get to your executive, they won't ask, okay, well, what do you want to do with your data? They won't be able to answer the, this type of question. If you ask the question, okay, well, what are your biggest business enablers, growth opportunities or issues, then they will speak and then you will see that data can help solve that. The second portion, super important, is assessing the use case and not only the impact. So don't look only at the incremental revenue or incremental uh, or decrease of cost or this type of things. Look at feasibility, technically, but also business change management, change management wise. And be a little bit tactical uh, and uh, strategic when you start uh, the use case. It, it might be a very good choice to go with a, an impact that is medium but where feasibility is very easy. So you, you get traction very quickly. You get uh, use case that are uh, winners. So suddenly uh, your executives will start thinking, okay, data is not uh, only uh, BS words and buzzwords uh, that everybody's using. It's delivering value for business. 
The last uh, thing is involve, involving the right stakeholders. So I said, uh, of course, you need to start by the business, but it's also to have uh, a very clear and identified business owner for each use case. Uh, so Mohamed is working very, very closely with the Amazon lead uh, in the company right now. His name is Derek. Just to be sure that, uh, okay, we understand perfectly how he works what are, what are his challenge and every week they touch base and they make sure that everything that is done by Mohamed and his team is going in the right direction. So we can change, there's no tunnel effect where Mohamed will go away for four months and come back with a tool and say, that's not uh, what we need, that's not what we want. So stay very close uh, with, with the client and the, the, the internal client uh, in this case. Also stay close with the tech team because at the end of the day, the tech team will be uh, will be uh, responsible to handle uh, the uh, the, uh, the algorithm and make me make it uh, live and maintain it, etc. So uh, you cannot be uh, on, on in your own little silo when you you do this type of uh, exercise. So I think that that's it for the presentation. Thank you, Mohamed, uh, again for all the work that you have done. So you you created really uh, some kind of. Uh, some kind of a big uh, revolution here in terms of data for Real Canada. So it's, uh, it's very exciting for the future. Yeah, definitely. I'm so excited about what we do together, the results that we're getting already, the traction that we create internally, the, the innovation that we bring as well with the lab and, and the fact that we have sponsorship internally. Uh, we have four minutes left, so maybe I can give as well my feedback from my side. I mean, data, data science is a journey. So uh, like, it's not gonna come from a day to the, the, the like the tomorrow tomorrow for you. It will take time. Uh, it will take sponsorship. It will take like good resources, good technical resources. There will be failure. There is always failure in in this type of thing because it's innovation, uh, and it's not a hundred percent like uh, sure guarantee that you'll get the result. And what he, what Leovic said about. The impact and feasibility is very important. Uh, always look for projects that are, uh, yes, feasible, uh, have impact, but as well, your ability to implement them would be easier. If you feel that the end user or the business line that would benefit from this project or this use case is not buying for it in the sense that they don't necessarily see it as a must for them, you better say, okay, that project, we leave it for later. Let's focus on something we know that the end user is craving for it because that would help like in the implementation. You wouldn't have to do much in change management. It happens to me many times where you create, for example, a forecasting model, pretty interesting. And then the, pl the planning, they come and they be like, okay, it's pretty interesting. But at the end, when you do your assessment, you realize that actually they don't use it. You don't use it because from the beginning, if a proper assessment was done, you would realize that actually uh, they are not buying for this type of technology yet. And this is very important as well to take in consideration, in my opinion. Presentation. Uh, I see we have already one question popping up in the chat. So, uh, oh, others coming, good. So the first question is, are the initiatives limited to L'Oreal Canada, or is there any interaction with uh, the larger L'Oreal family? Yeah, that's a good, uh, that, I will take this one. Uh, it's a good question. So we are a little bit, uh, in, L'Oreal Canada is a little bit, it's a small big country uh, for L'Oreal, let's say. So in the sense that uh, we are not, uh, we are not a small country in terms of uh, revenue, but we are not uh, top five either. So it means we don't have so much pressure to deliver results every day. So we are often used as some kind of innovation uh, or uh, uh, some kind of lab uh, country where we can test things. So the idea is to develop things here and little by little to try to export that uh, first to the US and to LATAM. Uh, we work uh, in the same zone, so it's, uh, it's, uh, we have the same technical environment. But uh, the, of course we want, uh, my dream is uh, to be the uh, yeah, the creation of uh, value from data that starts from Canada and uh, will uh, spread uh, spread into the world. That uh, that's uh, that's a little bit my and, ambition. And, and that will be right next to you. <laughs> Sorry, I said I'll be right next to you by that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, so uh, now it's um, uh, uh, there's other countries that are also working or other type of uh, of things. So there's, there's coordination on the use cases. We just don't want to. Uh, to uh, have uh, three different countries working on the same use cases, but uh, it's, uh, 
it's a it's a good time for Lower Air Canada, I would say. Thank you so much. I'm reading now the second question. Uh, what were the ways of working like between a CPG company and rocket science work? Uh, that's uh, that's interesting. So I, I will uh, start uh, the the beginning of the answer, and uh, Mohamed, you can complete more on your end. But uh, so we are a CPG company. But as I said uh, in the introduction, uh, we are we are also a direct to consumer company because we have website, we have stores. So uh, the, this this part of the business is easier to work with. I would say to start because we uh, we we have a more complete environment of data with consumer data, sales data, digital interaction data, etc. But little by little. Can expand uh, to other things, and the Amazon use case is typic uh, typically that. It's some uh, we don't own the data on Amazon, so we can find ways to get this uh, this information, all these pieces of uh, data, and then Mohamed can start working on it. So I'm not sure I'm answering the question, but uh, that's how I would answer. Yeah, if that wasn't enough, they can for sure add a follow up question to our chat. So thank you. Uh, next question, what was the team composition needed for the pilot use cases that were mentioned? For example, uh, two I, data scientists, one data engineer, etc. I can I can change, uh, I can answer that question. Uh, basically, uh, based on the assessment and what we wanted to deliver, because I wanted absolutely, after speaking with the management executive, we realized with Ludovic that there are people skeptic on, on, on board. So we wanted to make sure that we don't deliver any POC. Everything we wanted was solution based. So it would be implemented uh, and running uh, like in, 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 in at, at L'Oreal environments, integrated with whatever solution we need to integrate with. So for that, obviously, we needed one data scientist. We had uh, one machine learning engineer and uh, one software uh, engineer as well involved. So basically, that was the initial team. But obviously, you can compose your team, not just I have that flexibility because I'm a contractor of L'Oreal Canada. So I can basically play with my resources depending on the case. But if you are building a team internally, you might want not just to build a team based on one project, but probably about all the pipeline that you have on your roadmap and the different uh, aspects that are covered. But anyway, if you look at the framework, it gives you a guideline on re a resource uh, or a specific uh, uh, type of profile and when you need that type of profiles. Thank you so much. So we have another question. Has COVID shifted your AI strategy during implementation and how did you manage it? This is really an interesting one. Yeah, like, uh, and I, I will just add to, to the previous question, sorry. Uh, the fact that to, to work with an external company like uh, Mohamed's company, it could, it could be another, of course, but uh, I would recommend Mohamed's ones. But uh, it's uh, for, for my company, we are beginners there. And uh, so let's say if I have to uh, hire two data scientists, one data engineer, one data analyst, uh, I, right off the bat, that will be an issue because I, I won't have uh, approved the value of all this before. So uh, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a very good way also to start with external resources to be agile. From a COVID standpoint, that's, that's a good question. Uh, so I, I would say it has accelerated the appetite uh, for more data, I, I would say, uh, COVID, in the sense that uh, con consumer behavior have, of course, changed. So last year, we saw a massive lift in uh, e-com e uh, on online sales. So for me, uh, CRM and data guy, it's good because it means we have a lot of data in our environment, our own environment, so much more to work with. But we have seen this year, second year of COVID, uh, not weird things, but people are going going back, we are going back to real life. So we can see that from a retention standpoint, from a channel standpoint, uh, many, many various behavior, and we were not always understanding understanding what was happening. And uh, we saw that our forecasts were not always very good because it, uh, it was trying to forecast something that is very difficult to predict. And so all, all that to say, that showed us internally our management our executive committee that oh maybe uh, maybe we don't look at things the right way so we need more intelligent we need, we need more data we need more knowledge to understand where we go and that's where we say oh just looking at the past is not enough we need to uh, we need to think about the future predict and predict and prescript and uh, hence the appetite for ai and i would say in general 
uh, across industry in the majority of cases, especially tech or e-commerce, the appetite with, because of COVID, the appetite for data uh, had become like bigger and bigger, especially for anything related to automation, data science, machine learning. Okay, thank you so much to both of you. So for sure, COVID has uh, <clears throat> invalidated a lot of data that company was collecting during the year. And that has been like a big issue, I think, in all uh, different markets. So we do have other questions popping up. So the next one is, uh, is your strategy different between e-commerce and retail? Yeah, yeah, and I see that there's also a follow-up question to that from uh, Faraz and uh, where he is saying that there's obviously a gap in access to data between uh, these channels and how do we manage it? So yes, our strategy are different. We have various teams that are working uh, some of you know, on e-commerce, others on retail. At the end of the day, uh, all links back uh, to the client. So we need to be a little bit more con consistent. So it's also showing that for uh, data are a little bit silo, but if we want to uh, offer a consistent experience to clients, we need to, uh, to think a bit differently. And uh, uh, again, uh, the, the fact that we we, take, we took a step back and we look at the thing, I, I wouldn't say 360 because uh, it, it's not completely true, but uh, we, we, we took a step back from a consumer standpoint. We can look at things uh, differently. We, we, try and we can try to influence where we want the, the consumer uh, to buy or to, uh, to behave or to interact. Of course, at the end of the day, the consumer makes uh, our choice, but uh, definitely the, the strategy is different. From a data, you're right, there's gaps. There's definitely big gaps for everything that we, uh, we sell directly in our store online. We have uh, the full visibility of what's happening. It's uh, of course more difficult when uh, when we go to e-retailers, uh, to pharmacy, drugstores. We have nothing, which is uh, something that is a uh, very interesting from an AI standpoint. So let's say I don't I don't I don't know the number, but let's say two one third of the purchases are, are done with our channels and two thirds are done externally. Okay, how can we use AI to try to uh, to complete uh, the profile of the the consumer where we don't know what she has been buying? So. Is she, is she or is he leaving some uh, digital traces on the website that could say, mm, uh, we don't know if there's a purchase, but we can think that there is a purchase based on the behavior. So that's typically uh, the type of use case uh, use case for Mohamed to think of in terms of uh, predictive, uh, predictive statistics. Awesome. Thank you so much. I see you already covered also the uh, follow up question. So thank you mm -hmm. so much. Sorry, I'm doing your job. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. I'm. That's say uh, it was making sense. It was a follow-up question. So everything handled together. Thank you for doing that. Uh, the last question that I see in the chat, um, you mentioned Amazon data. Was there a way to get Amazon data at the consumer level matched to CRM? I, uh, we don't have this capacity uh, as of today. I don't uh, personally. I don't think Amazon exposed exposes this uh, this type of data at the customer level. Uh, that that would be great. But uh, one, I don't think it would be privacy uh, compliant, and two, I don't think it would uh, it would be useful for them. It would be for, fantastic for us, but not for them because they want to keep the data. But we still have a ton of data available. Maybe Mohamed, you want to speak a bit about the uh, the data set that you're doing. Absolutely. Now, Amazon, unfortunately, doesn't provide data uh, at the cost or fortunately for the customers, because <laughs> it, if, if it was the case, it would be a big, uh, a big problem in terms of privacy. Mm -hmm. uh, but the data available by Amazon uh, would be more at the product level and at the keyword level, which crossed with the bidding strategies in general is a gold mine for a, an e-commerce company or anyone selling on Amazon, actually. Yep. Thanks a lot. We just got another question. So uh, there is a shift now with the newer D2C brands uh, encroaching into the beauty space. How is the team viewing this in terms of strategy? Well, that's a large question. I'm not so sure i understand the word encroach uh so i think entering the uh the beauty space uh sorry for uh, my lack of uh, english vocabulary entering thank that's you right. uh, your intuition was right okay <laughs> <laughs> hey that's a good question so the um, 
L'Oréal started a while uh, a while ago, I would say in 2014, some kind of uh, digital transformation, a little bit like we want to do a data transformation now. Uh, so uh, we had a fantastic uh, CDO in, uh, in the global team uh, named uh, Lubmira Rocher, and she did a fantastic digital transformation. So the way we uh, we see that uh, is that we need to be different uh, from others, and uh, uh, typically we want to have services uh, on, on the website. So we want to facilitate the access to beauty to facilitate the beauty experience on our website. So especially especially during COVID, when uh, drugstore, pharmacy, etc., were not closed, but it was more difficult to get there, and it uh, it was not very reassuring. We rolled out a couple of services where you can do a skin diagnosis, haircut, uh, hair diagnosis when you still have hair, so which uh, starts to not be my case anyway. But uh, you you can do some uh, some services online that would recommend uh, to you. Okay, so you need uh, hydration or you need uh, whatever whatever type of product. And of course, at the end, we can attach that to uh, some marketing initiatives like uh, sending mail, sending routine product. So th that's a little bit uh, how we want to uh, be different than the competition and to uh, to really offer uh, a, an experience for the consumer, but to also ease the, uh, the beauty experience uh, even online. <laughs> Thank you <Thanks>. so much. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so this one seems to be the last question we have. Uh, thank you so much to both of you. Thank you so much for the presentation and for sharing uh, the framework and uh, for answering all the questions. Thanks a lot and have a great day. Thank you, thank you. everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye.